do some stretches or something. To, my body hurts so much. Now's the time. What? Now's the time. No, not while the camera's on. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. Welcome to the Concept Crucible podcast. Today, the skills edition. We are using some skills. Yeah. I, I realized I proposed this as a topic to Jim because this past weekend I went and recertified my first aid. And um, I also did my master's thesis on first aid as a skill. And I discussed the usefulness of, of first aid as being something that, I, as I tried to argue, you know, everybody should learn. And the utility in having people, like the everyday people walking down the street being able to do first aid. And then that got me thinking about this weekend. And then I'm thinking about podcast topics. And I'm like, Jim, like there's a lot of skills that you know people ought to learn or there are skills that were at one point thought to be essential that maybe have fallen out of favor um, or there are skills that people wish others learn like the skills that parents wish children would learn uh, life skills like the skills that children wish parents would learn yeah so they, whether or not you need to learn how to do laundry or cook or use technology or code or understand you know this or that like it's, a, it's an interesting topic and so it's worth my, diving into my argument was that when neither of us is in a position to dictate what skills a person should learn on account of we can't establish criteria for it no uh, i think we can agree that the world would probably be better off if more people uh or everyone knew for, was certified in first aid that yeah. that, that seems uh impossible to disagree with mm -hmm. Uh, but I think there's lots of things that the world would be better off with. Mm -hmm. um, and that is so one of the things we're going to talk about today. But first, our icebreaker. Ryan, what is a skill that you wish that you had that you don't? Uh, I think near the top of the list, and it speaks a little bit to us creating the podcast, is I wish uh, that I had, uh, maybe this will be a constellation of skills, uh, but I wish I had the skill to build things. Um, for example... My, I look up to my grandfather, and he worked as a mechanic and repair guy in the factories for a number of years, and he's very good with his hands, and he he would be, I guess the best way to look at it is he would be like the proto life hack person, that he buys a bunch of things and is able to build build something useful for himself out of it. Um, and it's a skill that my uncle, um, who lives with them, uh, has developed just through it. So, for example, my grandfather has rigged up, and I don't think these are all, like, he. it's not like you bought this one giant kit from one company. I think these are pieces that he picked up and rewired and modded over time. But he's got a setup in the basement um, for, because they live out in the country, and whenever the power goes out, you always have a problem with flooding in the basement because the sump pump stops working. So he's got... Such a system set up that a generator automatically kicks on and keeps the sump pump going. And there is a backup to that. And there are sensors that he's rigged in there to trip if the sump pump is running but fails and things like that. And it's just because he he knows how the... like He, he, he can't program a computer per se. But he understands simple um, computer parts and he understands pneumatics and he understands controls and whatnot and that he can he can envision what the final thing he wants it to do and he can just build it um now again that's a lot of different skills like specific skill sets but i wish i had a general uh the general sense of building things um in whatever sub skills you would need to so you know if i wanted to build a shelf instead of going and buying a prefabricated ikea one i could envision how it would fit together you know and i could buy it pick up the the materials for it and build it myself kind of deal it just says just as Stay an tuned example for our build a bookshelf video it's, from scratch that could be an interesting idea maybe for season two when we expand yeah, that'd be a fun way to spend an afternoon show. but uh so th that's i think that would be my the skill that i wish i had is i just i, I wish i was a little bit handier Concept Crucible <laughs> Podcast. Measure twice, cut once. So, how about you? What what skill do you wish you had? I wish I could play the saxophone. Mm, that would be a good one. So, I, I I played clarinet for a week in high school, and I was terrible at it, which is unsurprising. Um, but I could never really get the hang of 
instruments with reeds. Mm. Seriously, reeds can get straight effed. No. Uh, I just, I, I could never quite blow the right way. And clarinet, I don't know why I thought clarinet would be cool, but I did. Uh, I was young. Mm-hmm. Please forgive me. But the other thing with saxophone is, is a, I, I, like, I, I don't, I literally, I play, I play guitar, I play bass, uh, I play a bit of ukulele, I play a bit of piano, mm-hmm. uh, I sing, I do all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but the, the thing that, is, is is those are all things like I can play guitar and sing or I can play piano and sing or I could play bass and sing although that would be odd um, but not impossible but I I I don't do any solo stuff hmm. like I like it's really hard for me I play rhythm guitar I don't really I don't really play lead um, same with bass, same with like piano. I, I don't do a, I, I don't know how to do a lot of piano solos. Let's get more technical and more technical than the skills I have with my meager, meager piano skills. Mm-hmm. Um, but saxophone, saxophone is an instrument that as someone who, who, who enjoys blues and jazz is practically in, uh, designed for solos. Mm-hmm. Like you can play it in rhythm and it sounds great. But you can also just bust it out in an, in a in a solo that has an unforgettable style and looks super cool. Uh, seriously, like like, I mean, I I I have been wanting to learn the saxophone since I watched my first California Raisins video when I was a <laughs> child. The saxophone raisin was so cool. Is, is Bill Clinton your hero then? No, Bill Clinton is not my hero, <laughs> although he does play the saxophone. Lisa Simpson, also not my hero, but a saxophone player. Uh, def- Lisa definitely no, I mean, falls ho- much higher on the list. Than Bill Clinton. Than Bill oh, Clinton yes. Does. But, yeah, it was, it's it's more that I, it as a as an instrument for soloing, mm-hmm. it would be a really cool one, and it, is, it, and it really stands out. Um, there are lots of other instruments I wish I, I would love to learn, but that is the first one I thought of. Yeah, if I had, if I had to pick a, an instrument to learn, I'd probably want to learn violin, um, just because I like the sound of it, and um, I kind of look up to Sherlock Holmes a little I bit. Feel, I feel like that also is is, is we, today we've been exploring the differences between us. But again, violin is rigid, and the violin music is often rigid and rule based. Um, the, especially the, the sort of Holmesian style violin, which is classical violin. Yeah. And saxophone is blues and jazz. It's all improvisation. Very much so, yeah. And fly by the seat of your pants. Yeah. Oh, man. We're really different people, except really the same people. That, that never gets old. So uh, I think the, the right term would be complementary. Yeah, yeah, sure. We're wholly different and yet complementary. Mm-hmm. That's why I cut everything cool that you say. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there, there are certainly, like I said, we're, we're probably not in a position to dictate what skills everyone should have because yeah. partly because there are, there are lots, mm-hmm. but there are certainly skills that we wish everyone had mm-hmm. and yours was first aid. Yeah. Just, um, I mean, you could make all sorts of arguments why first aid would be important. Um, I mean, just from a pure numbers game, the more people the more people that you have that know it, the more likely it is that help is going to be available. Because usually when people think about first aid as something you need to learn, it's like, oh, I only need to know it if I'm never going to have access to a city or infrastructure mm-hmm. or if I'm going to be on the middle of nowhere. And that is true for, in Canada, for example, West Coast, where um, the nearest hospital can be over an hour away by, by vehicle or it could be a shorter route if you're more remote in a helicopter um, and there funny enough what I found when I was doing my master's work is the num- the percentage of people in the population who know first aid is higher in that, BC yeah, where, where there, it's, there's a foreseeable utility uh, it's a little bit harder to believe that though in a city like KW where the, the target time for an ambulance response is 8 to 10 minutes on average uh, and they've been slowly trying to shave that time off. Um, but if you say, go back to my Ignite talk, and we'll we'll put a link to it. Uh, in my Ignite talk, I talk about the the urgent need to get CPR started as soon as possible when a person stops breathing. 
Uh, and that's just biological reasons. You know, you don't want a person's brain to be without oxygen for much longer than four minutes then uh, because then brain damage will start in. So, I mean, the, the human body, it's kind of funny. The human body is, it's kind of difficult to kill, which I know sounds kind of weird, but the body has, it's such a well-tuned machine in general that the, mach- the, the, the machine, the, your body is pretty good about taking care of itself unless something is seriously wrong. So, I mean, you know, that's, you, your body, your body can manage itself, you know, it, it releases certain kinds of chemicals in your body, uh, or your brain really has certain chemicals released in there, and it'll affect your body. So, for example, um, shock, which is something you learn in first aid, shock is, is an amazing thing, because it keeps you alive up until it kills you, which doesn't make sense, but shock, the whole purpose of shock is it's, per, it puts the body in a position where it's protecting its vital organs and it will keep protecting the body including shutting off parts of your body in order to keep you alive so uh, the first thing that shock does is it shunts valuable oxygenated blood away from your limbs and into your core right so i mean like it basically that's why you go pale and why you go cold and whatnot is all the valuable oxygen is kept to your vital organs and then the longer you go, if the whatever cause of shock doesn't go away, you know, your ver- various organs will shut down in order to protect, you know, your heart, your lungs, your brain. And eventually, you this know, is why I always carry around a teddy bear. <laughs> I know. I know. Why the shock goes away. Le- learning first aid can sometimes be uh, can sometimes be uh, quite shocking in and of itself. No yeah, no, I'm, but... I'm I can feel the blood leaving my extremities, <laughs> and I w- want to go get my teddy bear. So uh, I guess I, maybe I've gone off on a little bit too much of a tangent, but uh, so you can talk about the the utility of learning first aid. Uh, but I sometimes think about it a little bit more in terms of, um, you know, and this might, this explanation might uh, appeal to you a little bit in terms of stakeholders and whatnot. Um, but it's kind of like a, a golden rule thing that, you know, I, you do, do unto others, right? That you'd want done to yourself is if I was in a medical crisis and I needed help, I would really hope that somebody would be there to help me at my worst moments. And that I usually flip around on myself and I want to make sure I'm in a position to be able to help somebody um, if they're at their worst moment, in medically at least, you know, because I'm a terrible, I'm terrible at empathizing, I suppose. But um, at the very least, I will do my best not to let you bleed to death kind of deal. So Yeah, hey, I appreciate that. <laughs> if we ever have like a head injury on the podcast... It'll be messy. We'll have to censor a lot of stuff out, actually. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. So I, that's that's first aid. I mean, there's other skills. I think people, like I wish people would know, and, and I even maybe go as far as to like creep into the. You know, you really should learn this. But uh, first aid is definitely one that I think um, you know the laws are changing now to reflect that idea that more people need to learn it. Um, and I think that it's just a good example of a skill that just the average person, it's its a good idea to know it, even if you never use it. And that's the thing is you take first aid hoping you never have to use it. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to be, you'd have to have something a little bit wonky going on upstairs if you take first aid hoping that you're going to need to use it. Like tomorrow, tomorrow somebody's going to break a leg. Yeah. Just know it. I mean, when I'm, I'm, at, feel it. When I'm working at the bar... Because uh, I do first aid at the bar, uh, and as a security guard, I'm required to have my first aid up to date. Uh, when I was in the campus response team, um, I always tried to hold on to the attitude that a good shift or a good day is when nobody gets hurt. So even if I am standing there for four hours and not have to, you know, not have to take out one band aid, it was a good shift. Um, it, my boredom be damned, you know. So it's it's just a good thing to have in the back pocket because I mean that's. Talib talks about the black swan. You know, these are the things that we... That, that, the things that have the most impact um, often come with things that we didn't yeah, expect Yeah, they're the things happen. you never see coming. Yeah. So, but I don't know. I've, I've talked a little bit. How about you? Do you have anything that you kind of wish people would learn? Yes. I wish that... I, I Actually, I wanted to remark, I don't know that I... Um, I, I, I don't... I tend not to, to, to go along with golden rule arguments. Mm-hmm. Uh, though the first aid one is a really good one, it's a good example. Other than yeah. you know the sadomasochist, but it, well, well, no, but it, I mean, it, it, it seems like it would be a better role to do unto others as they would have done unto them, mm-hmm. uh, rather than. But but even then, it seems reasonable to conclude that 
other people would like w- would like you to administer first aid if you are qualified to do so. Generally speaking, people don't want to die. Yeah, I think that 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 seems that seems like a pretty yeah, you know, sort of. If you if you want if you want to make it a little bit more universal, generally people don't want to suffer. Yes, that that's probably the the best way to encapsulate everybody. Is generally people don't want to suffer. First aid is a skill set that allows you to mitigate suffering. Yep. So, um, but anyway, so it's very, very utilitarian of you <sighs> coming outside your box. Well, I know. I know. I, I, I got. I got. I got to peek out every once in a while and stay relevant. Um, but anyways, we, I but yeah. You know, my my mine is a little more esoteric, um, but I, I think I think no less value. I wish that everyone knew how to um, play an instrument or or do a performance in public. And like it's 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 different than just than just playing an instrument. Playing an instrument often is a thing that makes you happy, mm-hmm. but you know, or or it or or you and the people around you immediately, or unhappy, mm-hmm. um, and as the case may be, becomes with practicing. Mm-hmm. But um, playing playing in public and playing for an audience is very different. Playing with other people, I we I did a video. Uh, ooh, a couple months back, it'll be over Ryan's face and in the show notes about the things I learned at Nerdfest, which was my first time playing on a stage with a couple of other bands where I wasn't part of all the other bands, and the 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 kinds of 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 you know the 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 big rule is is be the biggest fan of every other act. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's just a, it's a good rule for performance. I mean, I've done tons of performance from public speaking to theater to juggling to magic to music to, you know, the occasional bit of comedy. Mm -hmm. That's my real skill I wish I had was the ability to be funny on command. But that takes years and years of practice. Yeah. But no, like, like there's, there's a kind of, of respect that, that you want to accord. Mm Mm-hmm to people who are performing on the same stage as you and and you know whether it's sh- it's sharing space and sharing attention and, and and that kind of thing and i i learned a lot of that from copy red leader who were super amazing about that and but you know it's also it teaches you how to be a good audience member because you start thinking about people on stages as people in the same way that working in retail tends to make you a better customer mm-hmm. You you can empathize with the people who are on a stage, and you stop regarding them as as sort of commodities that that spew forth music on command. Um, and it changes the sort of feeling that you have in concerts and in performances. I mean, one of the things, I mean, you probably get a see a lot of this at, at karaoke. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I try and do is 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 you cheer for every performance, and you 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 don't you even if you're not cheering because it's good, uh, or because you didn't enjoy it. Uh, you are cheering because you acknowledge that that person came out and did a thing that was hard mm-hmm. and and acknowledging that helps them continue to do that and that that's 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 it like like if if for no other reason it it helps them do things that are difficult because getting uh, the the first time on a stage, I spent. I, I've been playing guitar for I'm thirty. Oh God, I'm old. I'm I'm not gonna say how old I am on the podcast. Though I think we talked about it in our first podcast. Um, but I've been playing guitar for about sixteen years, and only in the last three years did I ever play for other people. Um, and I was I was super self conscious about it. And I was I was not bad, you know. I was not incredible. I'm certainly no Frank Zappa, mm-hmm. but I was not bad. And I've definitely gotten a lot better since then. But I remember going to my first open mic, and it was at uh, it was at the, at the KW Poetry Slam. They do an open mic before their slam night, and so they're all they're all most of them are. are people who were involved in spoken word or spoken word artists themselves and so they were they were a really supportive and cool audience mm-hmm. 
uh, because they understood how nervous I was as, as my knees shook and I choked my way through uh, a couple of songs, like some Leonard Cohen and, and then a song about Cthulhu. But I, I was I was just terrified. And, and, you know, my second open mic was easier. My third open mic was easier than that. And then I, you know, I played some shows for charity events and... Um, I've got an upcoming gig that I'm not allowed to talk about yet, but I do have an upcoming gig. Um, if I can talk about it by the time this this cast actually comes out, I will put it in the show notes. But I'm not convinced that I'll be able to. But it's going to be cool. Um, but yeah, is so it, it's it's a thing that it's a skill that you learn that makes you happy, but it's also an atmosphere that teaches you a lot of things about people and about yourself and it, it involves doing something that is hard and even if you don't do it well it's it's like climbing a mountain mm -hmm. even if you suck at climbing that mountain if you get to the top you win you still did it mm -hmm. i mean Forget everything else. You 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 made it. And if you were to climb that mountain again, you would you can you can take what you did and learn from it and do it to, and, and improve. Mm -hmm. But even if you never climb that mountain again, you still did it once. And so you understand as a mountain climber, in some sense, what it is like to be a mountain climber. And so when when you see other people climbing that mountain. You can you can you can see them sort of as equals and go oh okay you know I understand that sometimes they suck at climbing but they're still getting to the top mm -hmm. and that's what matters and that I think is 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 it's a skill that comes very quickly from performing and it's a skill that we recognize in performing. Because it is is a thing that that so many people fear and dread getting up in front of like getting up in front of people and speaking is one thing, but you talk to people all the time. Mm -hmm. Getting up to people in front of people and doing a thing that most of them can't do, um, and that you're not like that you have practiced and you're not even sure yourself that you can really do, um, is is another thing entirely. Like and, and and trying to entertain them, but it is a thing that as a society we just totally fear. Mm -hmm. But it is when done super wonderful. None can defend against it. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I I have certainly had sets that were easily defended against, <laughs> but it is it is it is a thing that, that that fundamentally changes the way you look at performers and performances. Yeah, I mean, in the same way that doing a podcast changes how I think about podcasters. Yeah, and and making YouTube videos changes how I think about about YouTubers. Mm -hmm. And because now I like I won't I, I can't say that I that I have the inside track on that or anything like that, but I have a perspective from having done it um, that is not dissimilar to theirs. Mm -hmm. And some of you know some of the same challenges have occurred. I have climbed that mountain. They have also climbed that mountain. Mm -hmm. Many of them have done it better, but we both made it to the top. Mm -hmm. But I guess that 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 calls into question though the distinction. I mean, your like first aid is 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 useful. Mm -hmm. um, this doesn't seem very my mine doesn't seem very useful. Uh, but I would I I would argue that it's valuable. That was the big thing that came up in our pre-show was usefulness versus value yeah. in skills. Because when we think of skills, we use the example of high school students. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're learning things in high in school, the usual argument slash complaint that you hear from high school students is i'm never going to use this ever again no actually uh or a more relevant case for me i don't know about you and your family but a relevant case for me especially if uh in the context of philosophy is you say you study philosophy and the first question is usually okay what are you going to do with that yep so i mean whether or not you're in high school learning how to calculate amortization rates, you know, 
even though you would argue that would be useful because we all carry debt. <laughs> yeah, amortization rates actually seems kind of useful. Yeah. I was going to go with trigonometry. Uh, yeah, uh, I th- okay, yeah, trigonometry might be it, you know, a little bit of Sokotoa or anything like that, right? Like At the time, you're learning it, and you don't see the end game in terms of, you know, where you're going to apply the, this knowledge. Um, so whether or not you're in high school or, like I said, if you're in university and you're studying something that... Um, it doesn't have an immediate use, you know, you, or it's really hard to answer the question of what can you do with that. That typically is is where people's thinking goes is what what is the utility? What is the value? How are you going to do something? How are you going to make money with this? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so we're an interesting it's an interesting concept that needs to be fleshed out there because, as you said, there are skills that are certainly useful and are they're valued because they're useful they may be valued for other reasons but they're valued because they're useful but then there are some skills that are valued regardless if a person finds it immediately useful yeah well i mean when you think about um if if, if we if we're measuring things entirely in the, in the sort of gauge of usefulness then the mona lisa is rather poor firewood mm. Like and that that's the thing is 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 for me I I, I partly it's it's I, I I am biased because I have a lot of skills that I think are valuable but are not immediately useful. I mean I juggle and do magic tricks mm-hmm. and play instruments and make videos and mm-hmm. things like that and those are quite, those are probably questionably useful mm-hmm. uh, in in comparison to I can't even uh, first aid for instance first aid is is a skill which is undeniably useful. Mm-hmm. And but but I but I, I I I think that skills like that are valuable not just in the sense that they they provide us with well being, mm-hmm. but that they um you know they are useful because they serve no practical purpose like there there are there is more to our lives than merely the practical purposes of the things that we do, mm-hmm. and and. That seems that seems clear in in part because when we when we focus only on the practical things, we often wind up being unhappy, uh, or you know, or experiencing experiencing depression. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, I mean, when when pressure exists for everything to be useful, then lot yeah, lots and lots of things become not useful. Most of the books on the shelf wouldn't qualify as useful. Uh, some of them would. There's some. There's some nonfiction down the bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even then, like the the study of, I think what was the, what was the example I used in the pre-show? Astronomy. Mm-hmm. Astronomy is not useful. It, Charlotte, um, my nerd night boss. She's amazing, but she will hate me for saying this. Um, but it's true. Astronomy is not very useful. You know, it's kind of funny. It's not useful now. But there was at one point when it was considered useful to study. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, the ancient Greeks uh, considered st- studying astronomy very astronomy useful. Astronomy was very useful back then because you would navigate by the stars. Well, not just that, but also um, Plato thought of it as teaching uh, mathematics and geometry, which yeah. was important. Yeah. But uh, now you can just learn math. Yeah. But astronomy, like astronomy is a whole separate discipline from math now. Um, and it's not useful. Like the... The things that we learn about pulsars hmm. and supernovas and the millions and millions and millions of dollars that we spend on radio telescopes and space telescopes to look at stars which are which by the time we are seeing them are ancient does does not in any way help anyone who is not an astronomer with their everyday life there is no point at which a thing that we have learned from a supernova has helped someone build a car it's interesting because when you were talking about that i immediately thought um that another perfect example of that is knowledge on pop culture not knowing of culture but knowing of like pop culture like for example knowing this or that celebrity or knowing things about them usually in no way 
Oh, that stuff is you. super useful. Oh, yeah? Yeah. No, the, knowing about pop culture helps you relate to people. Like, it helps you relate to the people around you, which is a useful thing to be able to do. I have never once thought it to be useful. No, to but, but to that it's partly because you don't hang out with those people. <laughs> I guess so. But it, in, in the same way that, that watching, watching the same television shows as people. Mm. I mean, it gives you a common context in which to operate. And, and it helps you communicate in ways that are meaningful in the same way that you and I can talk about The Simpsons. Well, I don't know, but I mean... Or Power we, Rangers. We all sleep under the same stars. We all have we do, a common but frame of reference. I don't, sleep, I, don't, I don't sleep under the same stars as people in the country, though. You look up from my balcony, you'll see barely anything. No, you're still sleeping under the same stars. Yeah, you're but I can't about, see them. You're talking about light pollution. That's entirely but, different. But, but the point being, the, my, my point is that it's not useful. We don't study astronomy because it's useful. We study astronomy because it's important. Mm. Pop culture knowledge is useful, but as I, I believe that the case that you're making is that it is not at all important um, or, or or it holds very little important. But I mean, it's the same with archaeology. Mm-hmm. We, we do archaeology and paleontology not because it is useful to understand, um, you know, past the details of past wars and, you know, how dinosaurs functioned and things like that. I mean, again, we're not going to we're not going to incur a lot of scientific advances or or things like that out of paleontology. We do it because it matters. We do it because it's important, because it helps us understand our place. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and and I mean as much as astronomy teaches us about our place in space, archaeology and paleontology teach us about our place in time and and how we exist in that context. We like it these are things, you know, in the same way that theoretical physics, you know, occasionally has, has you know, does something that is revolutionary and commercializable, mm-hmm. but most of the time sort of discovers weird things of the universe when it is discovering things, which is not that often. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's so, so as, at least insofar as it makes like, you know, regular media. Mm-hmm. But we, we don't do it because because it's going to be useful. We do it because it matters. Because it helps us understand things. And that in itself, while not useful, is valuable. So, I mean, I mean, we do all sleep under the same stars, but we don't all think about them. Mm-hmm. Not nearly as much as, as often as we think about television. Yeah, I suppose. But, yeah, and I think that there are, there are lots and lots of skills... And disciplines that focus on things that that are more are 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 not so much um, useful as they are valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't make music because because it's useful. We make music because there are people who need to make music, and and we listen to music because it is valuable. You know, and that's why we favor we favor certain kinds of music rather than say. Um, there, there have been a bunch of studies done on music improving productivity and things like that, but we don't strictly, re, re, you know, we won't restrict ourselves to those kinds of music. We, re, we, we, we listen to music that we enjoy. We listen to music that, um, inspires feelings in us. Um, and, and that's going to differ based on mood and what kind of day we're having and, mm-hmm. you know, with the meaning of a specific song sort of a postmodernist when it comes to skills the relationship is between the skill and the mm-hmm. and the practitioner yeah. but cuz even even things that are generally thought of as not being useful still has uses like you can still use it for something uh just it's usually con- like it's usually within specific context like astronomy is useful within a specific context and whatnot I don't. I don't think the usefulness is the way to cash that out, though. Well, what but the, but the the part that I'm trying to get at is is, and we were trying to rack our brains about this. Is there any skill that is completely useless? Yeah, and I think I think having thought about it and having reflected on it, no. Just just sort of trivially, mm-hmm. it, it seems impossible. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you, yeah, you wouldn't develop. Uh, you wouldn't develop the concept of a skill around a certain set of abilities, knowledge, or doing something unless, like, it, it'd have to be completely. Like, if it was completely arbitrary, why would you build like? Well, I mean, so you even you can look at something like uh, I use the example of napping. Mm. Um, 
which but napping's it's it's not really a skill and i mean like okay. we can we can we can cut we can split hairs on 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 whether napping is a skill or not there are people but, in the slc that have highly, <laughs> de- highly developed, developed nap skills senses. Uh, but, in order to but I was I was that. I was just gonna I was just gonna come up with a different example, which was meditate, which is meditation, yeah, which is a discipline and is a thing that you practice and do. I don't I don't do any meditation, but I know enough people who do it to know that it's like people who do it who and and do it a lot take it very seriously and they work very hard at it. Um, but it isn't a thing that that you that is sort of outwardly useful. Um, but no, I mean my argument for there being no useless skills was purely that. Anything that is useful is valuable, um, and anything is going to be useful in a specific in, in in some context. I mean, there exists an infinite number of contexts for skills to happen in. So even if my skill is playing three notes of Vivaldi mm. on a violin, in a situation where I need to play the beginning of a Vivaldi tune. That is super useful. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, like the the question we we ask about skills usually is not whether or not they are useful because that's sort of not an interesting question to ask about skills, but how broadly useful they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and often that usefulness gets translated into how commercializable are they? How I mean, that's when someone asks you what you're going to do with your degree, that's what they're really asking. Huh. They're not asking. They're they're not asking. You know, what are you going to do with your degree? I'm going to be smarter and happier and. I'm gonna fall in love. I'm gonna change the world. Are you gonna make any money? Yeah, but even even <laughs> even if you're not changing the world, even if you're just doing regular like life people things, I'm gonna fall in love. I'm gonna have a couple of kids. I'm gonna live a. I'm gonna live a life, and eventually, I'm gonna die. That is an unsatisfying answer to that question. Just just so you're aware, people get really upset. Well, yeah, but <laughs> we're also missing the point that um, then it's not really what you learned or the skill that you have that brings that about. You know, like. It would be like, okay, why'd you study philosophy? You know, I'm going to do all these things in, you know, with my life. It's like, well, why didn't you just learn engineering, do all that stuff, and make more money? Yeah. You know, so. Um, but but it's, like I said, it's, a, it's, an, it's an unsatisfactory question, the answer of what are you going to do with that? Mm-hmm. Um, because the answer is you're going to do pretty much the same stuff, only you might be better off. Mm-hmm. And, they, and, and it maybe also takes into account what people consider better off. Mm-hmm. I mean, but in in general, the, the question of usefulness um, over value uh, to bring it back to first aid, which mm-hmm. which I think is is again, it's it, it is it, the the usefulness of first aid is undeniable. Mm-hmm. If you in a, in any context where first aid is useful, first aid is extraordinarily useful, mm-hmm. and there are lots of contexts. People are not going to stop being mortal. Anytime soon, mm-hmm. though my fingers are crossed. Um, and first aid conveys value not just in those situations, mm-hmm. but in any situation where there is potential for injury. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why you have to have it as, as a security guard, right? It's because is is not because um, someone will get hurt. Mm-hmm. And you will be there to to administer the, to them. You will, or minister to them. You're not administering to them, but it's because you exist. You, you know, you, during a security shift, you have four hours standing there, and in any time at those four hours, someone could get hurt. Mm-hmm. But even if no one gets hurt, it's still a valuable skill mm-hmm. because what you're what you're what it operates on is the hypothetical. Mm-hmm. And it operates on this. I mean, I mean that it, it is. It's a hypothetical that holds true if you're at the mall, or at concert, or at home, building a bookshelf. Mm-hmm. I mean, seriously, if we build a bookshelf, I pretty much guarantee you somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> I'm not saying who it is, but somebody is going to get hurt. We'll find out. But no, it's not going to be me. I mean, yeah. I'm gonna stay far away from that, but but yeah, I mean, I mean, so it, it covers. It, it's the question isn't isn't. It's interesting that we 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 started out thinking about whether something is useful or whether something is valuable, but the question seems to be more sort of how broadly valuable or how broadly useful is it? At least with the questions of usefulness, I'm not convinced that that applies to things that are valuable. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, if you think about novels, the notion that a novel, you know, there are, there are great novels that don't that don't appeal to very many people. Uh, actually, or, or use the example of art, uh, Van Gogh. Van Gogh could barely sell a painting when he was alive. Um, only well after his death did people sort of take into a, you know and realize look at his art and go, wow, this is actually really incredible. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of poppies and butterflies. But I mean, in 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 that sense, for a while there, it was only valuable to a to a small amount of people. In fact, one person. Um, but and that was sort of because we hadn't understood its its real value. And that's also because value is sort of intersubjective. Mm-hmm. I mean, value isn't a fixed thing. Mm-hmm. Well. It, it, speaking of Van Gogh, and then also what we were um, starting off our pre our pre podcast conversation about is uh, things that change over time. And actually, we touched a little bit about it in astronomy that things will over time f- change in terms of usefulness and value. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, novels and books and stuff were highly useful for educational purposes when, like Gutenberg press came out especially when the gutenberg press came out because you could disseminate information much easier than before and education rates could go up further right um and so uh if i can find a link to it um i'll post it in the show notes but there was there was a either a podcast or an article that i read that was discussing where somebody said that they think that um that the technological illiteracy that is going on today is going to be a huge detriment going forward, that people should learn how to have a little bit more technological literacy. Now, in remembering it for the podcast, I remember it more in terms of like coding or understanding programming language, but it could very well just be being able to use and interact with the technology. I'm not sure that would be cleared up in the in the original article or podcast, but um, but it did get me thinking like, are there things that we learn that really we don't need? And are there things that um, we should be learning that are emerging as things that we need to, to learn to better accommodate ourselves to the world that we find ourselves situated yeah. in? Um, you know, because everybody seems to think that math and reading or language, um, uh, those kinds of skills are perennial. Like everybody should learn it. That's what we teach in school. That gives you the basics of which you allow yourself to be navigating the it's world. Been away for thousands of years. Yeah, but are there things now now that are the present state of things has brought us to this point that we should be learning? You know, and I, I don't know. I don't know if I have an answer to that. I, I'm not. I'm not ahead enough of the curve to know what what is valuable to have because it's going to be useful. I feel like this stuff. So I, I, I have a small list of things that I keep thinking about that would be valuable to have, but they, they, they while valuable to have, they are um, very difficult to teach. And in in a setting like like where, where I mean, where you would learn math and English, presumably in, in school, mm-hmm. it would be impossible to teach. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't teach responsibility in school. Being responsible is a really big part of of everyone's life. Mm-hmm. I mean, as much as I like to occasionally complain about being an adult. Although I do rather enjoy being an adult, mm-hmm. um, if you are the kind of adult that people think as think of as irresponsible, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, like just just flat out, you want. I mean, no one is absolutely responsible in every sense, but there are you know, the the understanding of of when to be responsible is a very important one to have. Mm-hmm. Because if you if you are an irresponsible adult, you were going to have a bad time. Mm-hmm. Um, having having spent several years as an irresponsible adult, I understand. <laughs> um, or stuff like financial management, mm-hmm. which is a really good thing to learn. Like not even not even the the nitty gritty of you know interest and mortgages and all that, but just how to think about money mm-hmm. in a meaningful way. Really cool thing to learn. Really hard to teach, especially to 30 students who come from entirely different financial situations. Yeah. Like, who already have all these thoughts about money and, and and what money is and what it means. And, like, it would just, it would be, it would be so impossible to teach 
to teach that to them, I mean, partly because you'd need to come up with something that respects all their situations. And how do you do that when you have, you know, somebody from the nicest part of town with somebody from the worst part? Like they live entirely different lives. Money impacts them in entirely different ways. Mm-hmm. So it's it's sort of, and and combine that with, I mean, people with with different lifestyles, people from single parent homes or, or or things like that. People who've recent whose families have recently immigrated. Like there's just the 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 context is too wide to fit in a classroom. Mm-hmm. But it would be a really cool thing to learn, mm-hmm. and it would be really useful for people to learn earlier, and it would help them out. Forever. It would be useful and it would be valuable because it would help them um, be sort of better at being people and be happier people. Mm-hmm. Um, be- because, I mean, a lot of the things about money aren't so much how to manage it as how not to be afraid to manage it. Mm-hmm. But regardless, what is, what is, is, because we, we should probably wrap up with what is your most valuable skill? The best one. Mm hmm. I would say uh, the one that I use the most um, and has really come in handy is um, my ability to improvise and apply things or apply knowledge to to new situations. Well, not necessarily new situations, but to apply previous experience into new things. You know, it's just if I come up with something or come against something that's novel that I've never tried before. Um, then I can, you know, look and like, okay, it, this reminds me of the time that I did this or, uh, you know what, let's try this out, let's test it. And if it doesn't work, we can easily flip to something else. So, uh, I find I'm pretty good about that. And I actually, I attribute that to the, to studying philosophy that I, I was often <laughs> forced to jump feet first into something that I didn't have a lot of experience with and try to make sense of it quickly and do something with it. I feel like that's tied to your scholastic responsibility. Yeah, but that was the way I got through undergrad and grad school. Like it was, it was a skill that I developed that I was able to to push myself forward. Yeah. And I and I find that um, I I get invited to do things um, because of a previous experience, mm-hmm. even though I don't have a direct direct understanding or direct uh, experience of this new thing. So, for example, uh, when Scoble asked me to MC. Uh, for Project Mac for Mac for oh, man. Night, that was right? a couple of years ago now. Yeah, and uh, it was less. I, I, in the end, it was less to do with emceeing and more to do with the karaoke at the end, the end of the night. Uh, but at the same time, um, a friend of mine, he's getting married, and he asked me to emcee his stag and doe, right? And I mean, it's it's I have a little bit of experience with emceeing through the bar, but not in this context. It's something different. So I can, but I can, I have enough knowledge that i can apply to it that i can improvise my way through it you know you can fake it until you make it kind of deal yeah which is very virtue ethics of me that (laughs) even if you don't possess the virtue you act as if you have the virtue and eventually one day you you wake up and then you do and then you keep acting that way anyway yeah and mine mine is probably uh empathy i i it is a thing that I spent a lot of time thinking about and a lot of time working on. And I will continue to spend a lot of time thinking about and, and practicing. But I, I recognize that I am more empathetic than I have been. And that is a thing that I value very much. Mm-hmm. I also recognize that I can still continue to be more empathetic. Um, because I am not as empathetic as I would like to be. Mm-hmm. It's interesting though. We both we both picked things as our best that are very broadly useful. Mm-hmm. I mean, the ability to adapt to, to to new situations, you encounter new situations all the time. In the same way that the ability to empathize with people um, encounter, you know, is something that you can do with anybody anywhere, mm-hmm. um, and often is necessary to do with anybody anywhere. So there might be some things, some some sort of tighter connotations for this use value thing. We might talk about skills again in season two mm-hmm. and, and, and press on this a bit more. But it's interesting because the skills that we wish we had yeah. were, were much tighter. I mean, yours was pretty, it was pretty broad because it was just building stuff. But I mean, I just wanted to play the saxophone. Mm-hmm. I feel like I may have uh, shorted myself on that. 
<laughs> All right. If you have a cool skill, I want to hear about it. Post a comment or a link to a video of you doing your skill. If it's, Ooh, that would be especially cool. if it's performance based, we want to see some uh, performing. Skills. Not if it's pornography. No, we don't want to get banned. No, please don't. Email those instead to yeah. Ryan. Yeah, but yeah, or leave a comment with what you think is your most valuable skill or your your most useful, or maybe what that means to you. Hmm. Either way, we will be back in two weeks. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. We're signing off. Stay awesome. You can always just put an image, like just a simple black background with like uh, no image available, and then just play the audio on top of it. With a Foley sound of a car crash? No, it's just, just <laughs> the, the sound of me hitting my head. It's going to go in my Foley archive. All right. Now I have to start a Foley archive. It's a useful thing to have. It is if you make videos.